On Sunday, July 22nd, 2007, two members of the Pettit family, Jennifer and Michaela, went shopping at their local Stop and Shop grocery store in Cheshire, Connecticut. Michaela, who was 11 years old, loved cooking dinner for her family. So they were shopping for groceries for Michaela to prepare that night. As they went about their own business in the store, a 27-year-old man nearby named Joshua Komasarjevsky took notice of them, particularly enticed by Michaela. He continued watching them and eventually followed them home, making plans to rob them. But he wasn't going to act alone. He enlisted the help of 44-year-old Stephen Hayes, a man he had met in AA and NA meetings a year prior. Though they originally planned to just rob the family, this would go on to become the most brutal and disturbing case in the state's history, with both men being sentenced to death after the crimes that took place later that night. But before all this, the Pettit family lived very admirable and prosperous lives. Jennifer Hawk and William Pettit met at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in 1985. Both of them were in the medical field, with Jennifer being a new oncology nurse, and William studying to become a doctor. They immediately hit it off and married that same year. William continued working hard in school and entered practice as a physician in 1989. The couple also began their family together, with their first daughter Haley being born October 15, 1989. They then had a second daughter six years later on November 17, 1995. The family would buy a nice home at 300 Sorghum Mill Drive where they would live for several years. The first major misfortune that came to the family was when Jennifer was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 1998, when her daughters were 9 and 3. But the family made the most of this situation and continued thriving. Haley created a walk MS team called Haley's Hope that helped raise funds for MS research. She was also very talented in both sports and academics, graduating from Miss Porter's school with honors. She had big plans for her life, including plans to study medicine at Dartmouth College the following semester. Michaela also did very well for herself at just 11 years old. She planned to take over Haley's Hope and rename the walk team to Michaela's Miracle when Haley left for college. She was an avid cook who would prepare dinner for her family most nights. William was a successful endocrinologist and medical director at Joslin Diabetes Center. Jennifer was a school nurse at Cheshire Academy who was loved by the surrounding community. She even had the school yearbook dedicated to her in 2005. While the Pettit family was flourishing and building their life together, two men met each other at the Silliman Halfway House in 2006. If Stephen Hayes and Joshua Komasarjevsky hadn't coincidentally found each other, it's very possible that this crime never would have taken place. Prior to their meeting, both men had very rough lives. Stephen had been in and out of prison since he was 16 years old. He was arrested nearly 30 times between 1980 and 2007, with him spending most of his time incarcerated during those years. Joshua was adopted when he was two weeks old and lived in a well-meaning but atypical and crowded household. In the early 90s, when Joshua was a young teen, he was accused by his sister of sexually assaulting her. Joshua's adopted father would admit that this was likely true. Joshua went on to get involved with the wrong crowd in his teens, and his behavior deteriorated from there, with him committing burglaries and getting expelled from a day program. He was also later in and out of prison and had gotten into drugs. When these two men came together and joined their delinquent personalities, they plotted with each other to rob a home for some quick cash. Now back to July 22nd, 2007, Joshua scouted potential victims Jennifer and Michaela of the Pettit family. He followed them home and let Stephen know that he had found his targets. The two men arrived at the home in the early hours of July 23rd. From the back of the house, they could see a man sleeping on the couch in the sunroom. Joshua gained entrance to the house by making his way through an unlocked door to the basement. On the basement stairs, he found a baseball bat, which he used to attack William, the father of the Pettit family. Joshua hit him four or five times, causing extensive injuries. The pair tied up William, binding him by his ankles and wrists with zip ties and rope. William struggled initially, not wanting the men to get to his family. But one of the men told the other, if he moves, put two bullets in him. The men then went to each of the girls' rooms and restrained them. They tied their limbs to bedposts and put pillowcases over their heads so that they could not see. They then went back to William and brought him from the sunroom to the basement. 
where they tied him to a support pole. Now with all the members of the family restrained, they searched the house for money. They didn't find as much as they were looking for, but they did find a check register in Jennifer's name that had a balance of $40,000. It was at this point that the plans changed from a simple home robbery to something far, far worse. Stephen left the home and went to a gas station nearby. He had brought two gas cans from the house, which he filled with $10 worth of gas. After dropping the cans back off at the house, he untied Jennifer and drove her to the bank. He forced her to withdraw $15,000 from her line of credit, but while Jennifer was inside alone, she alerted the bank teller that she and her family were being held hostage by two men who were threatening to kill them. The bank manager called 911, at which point the police began setting up a discreet vehicle perimeter so that the perpetrators could not escape. Jennifer got back into the car with Stephen and was driven back home. Although the criminals were not aware that the police were now onto them, they were given more time to carry out their crimes. It was very unlikely that they would get away with the perimeter being set up, but the family was still in immense danger, and perhaps if the police had responded in a different way, the tragedy soon to come may have been able to be prevented. As the police set up the perimeter, Joshua was still at the pet at home. He made his way to 11-year-old Michaela's room, where he began raping her. He even photographed the horrible assault on his cell phone. More evidence of this was found later when the medical examiner performed an autopsy on Michaela, finding semen in her body. Joshua poured bleach on her clothes in an attempt to cover up what he had done, but that was not enough. At this point, Stephen had arrived back at the house and discovered what had happened. He felt provoked by Joshua and took Jennifer to the living room. There, on the floor, he raped her. From the basement, William was close enough to overhear what was going on, and shouted up the stairs. One of the men shouted back down, Don't worry, it's all gonna be over in a couple minutes. William was unable to sit and accept this, and struggled to free himself, figuring it would be his only chance. He managed to escape out the basement door, and crawled to a neighbor's house for help. Joshua realized that William had escaped, and alerted Stephen, who was still assaulting Jennifer. Upon hearing this, Stephen strangled Jennifer to death. By this point, William had made contact with a neighbor who was initially unable to recognize him due to the severity of his wounds. Back at the house, Joshua and Stephen knew the police would be there soon, and decided to destroy as much evidence as possible. They began pouring gasoline all over the home, including Jennifer's lifeless body. They also went to Michaela and Haley's rooms, where they continued to douse the bedrooms as well as the girls themselves, while they were still alive. Stephen and Joshua then set the house on fire and escaped in the Pettit family car, marking the end of the seven-hour invasion. They were immediately spotted by the police and pursued. They crashed into a police car and tried to escape on foot, but were arrested only a block away from the site. They had at last been caught, but it had taken too long for the girls to be saved. Haley almost managed to escape the home and was able to free herself from her restraints. She made it out of the bedroom and tried to make it to the stairs. She made it down the hallway and collapsed, dying of smoke inhalation. She was found with third and fourth degree burns on her feet, indicating that she was likely burned while she was still alive. Michaela was also found with her hands still tied to the bed, and her lower body was hanging off of it. The medical examiner speculated that she likely also had a painful death though she too died from smoke inhalation. Both Joshua and Stephen confessed to the murders, though they blamed the brunt of the crimes on each other. Joshua claimed that he thought Michaela was 14 or 16, as if that would be at all redeeming. Both perpetrators expressed guilt in court, stating that they never wished for anyone to die, though this does not change the fact that they are solely responsible for what happened. They were each charged with 17 counts relating to the Pettit family murders, Stephen was found guilty of 16 counts, and Joshua all 17. Stephen was sentenced to death in December 2010, and Joshua received the same sentence the following year. However, in 2015, the Connecticut Supreme Court vacated death sentences, changing their sentences to life in prison. For the first time in the state's history, the court offered the jurors of Stephen's trial post-traumatic stress assistance due to the disturbing images and details of the case. William, the sole survivor of the event, managed to live on and do great things in memory of his family. He started scholarships, fundraisers, and foundations in their names, 
and even met a woman named Christine Palouf, who was volunteering at the Pettit Family Foundation. He went on to marry her and had a child with her on November 28, 2013, sparking new hope into William's life. He was also elected as a state representative in 2016. Though the atrocities Stephen and Joshua had committed were truly horrible, they will remain in prison for the rest of their lives, and William will go on to honor the memory of his family as best he can. <laughs>